There we go. Thank you. So welcome to this very first uh, conversations on decoloniality and fashion organized by the Research Collective for Decolonizing Fashion. My name is Angela Jansen and I am based in Belgium together with Erika de Geef and Shaina Gonsalves, both based in South Africa, I will be convening the conversations. We have been absolutely overwhelmed by the amount of registrations, which not only shows a growing interest in the topic, but also a real demand for information on decoloniality and fashion. The aim of this conversation series, however, is to experiment with alternative ways of knowledge production through the communal, through conversation and beyond status, institutional, disciplinary and geographical boundaries. This requires an active participation of everyone and hopefully a monthly commitment in order to be able to build trust, respect and eventually a strong community. But considering the growing demand for more information on decoloniality and its convergence with fashion, we do feel an urgency to develop an online course, which we hope to start in September of this year. We will be using the inputs, the topics and the concerns raised during the conversations to develop this course. We are happy that the group today consists of students, researchers, teachers, practitioners and activists across disciplines, race, gender, age and geography. We would like to take this opportunity to remind ourselves to be respectful of each other's feelings, opinions and learning, and most importantly, unlearning. The topics can be experienced as difficult, confrontational, violent and painful. Miscommunications, misunderstandings and misinterpretations are bound to happen. And we ask everyone to be compassionate, empathetic and considerate of each other's journeys. Now, just a few guidelines to make the experience pleasant and useful for everyone. We like to suggest we start with 20 minutes of conversation between Erica and me on the reading, and then the 20 minutes in a breakout room of five people to allow everyone to contribute to the conversation. We would like to encourage you to embrace this rare opportunity to learn with and from people who experience and think about decoloniality from different parts of the world and whose varying time zones bring us together at different moments of our days and lives. The final 20 minutes, we will all come back to the main session again, where the different breakout groups can share some of the topics and ideas discussed. When you have a question or you would like to speak, please simply write, I have a question in the chat so we can keep track and give you the floor. We prefer to, to keep the question live spoken rather than written text in the chat folder. Have a, having a conversation with so many people will ask some patience and discipline from everyone. Before you speak, it would be nice if you could turn on your camera, share your name and the place you are based. Remember that this is an experiment consisting of trial and error where hopefully by the end of the series, we will all have learned from it. Any suggestions, comments or concerns on how to improve the experience are most welcome. Finally, I would like to welcome Shayna Gonzalez, who has only recently joined the RCDF team. She's based in Johannesburg, South Africa. And for this session, she will be assisting you with any logistical and technical issues you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, thank you so much for um, just setting the groundwork for where we're going to go today. Um, so my name is Erika de Grief and I am so excited to share this space with so many of you. Um, it is almost, um, it's just been 10 o'clock at night in South Africa. So for a Saturday night, this is a really interesting date night <laughs> um, to be discussing decoloniality and fashion um, with such an important sort of um, set of, of conversations. So I think when Angela and I started conceptualizing the, um, the, the idea of having a kind of global conversation, um, we never expected the size of, of group. Um, so we were both a little bit 
taken aback by that, um, but I really do want to welcome you all. Um, it kind of evolved from the Fashion Theory Journal, the special issue Fashion Theory Journal that Toby um, Slade and Angela um, co-edited last year. And as with so much um, disciplinary work um, or academic work, it lands in a journal, but then how does it how does it grow? How does it develop? How does how do we expand on that conversation? So this is really a starting point where we're trying to say how do we expand on those conversations? How do we take it further than just uh, staying in a journal? So I think the first question that I think is really important for all of us to kind of set the scene for for today um, and for the series, I think is is really like how do we how do we talk about positionality um, in relation to this, this conversation. So we're looking at decoloniality and fashion and we're, we're having to look at our positionality. How do we relate to it? So Angela, you know, I, I think maybe just between you and I, we, we've spoken about this a lot. Um, and, and as a white South African, you know, I think my experience of that is is incredibly strong, um, and it, it started possibly twenty years ago when I started lecturing. I was a fashion theory lecturer and a fashion history lecturer at a at a um, fashion school, and the curriculum at the time was still incredibly um, limited and incredibly Eurocentric. And this was the time of the. This was just after nineteen ninety four, so the new democracy. And I have, I had to be radical. I had to sort of make space and make room for other kinds of narratives, and particularly narratives of of um, South African um, people of color, into the classroom. How do you how do you invite that into the classroom? So my positionality as a as a as a white South African, um, and and what could I do to disrupt? The Eurocentricity that was still so much embedded in in the curriculum, in museums, in the media. So I know I know that you've also struggled and you've also dealt with positionality in in, in a really um, diverse kind of way. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. Yes, so I speak as a white European uh, female from the so-called privileged side of the colonial difference and from within the epistemic territory of modernity. Um, I use the word so-called because privilege sounds like I earned that position, whereas it is a position that has and continues to be established on the subjugation of others. It is an active rather than a passive act. And I think it's important to acknowledge that questioning modernity coloniality from my position is not the same as questioning it from the other side of the colonial difference. I think it's important to remind myself again and again that I do not speak from a position of the colonized, subjugated or erased. And um, that is what decoloniality represents for me. That is how decoloniality touches me. It allows me to understand my implication in the modern colonial order and to take responsibility. It enables me to confront myself with some of the most persistent, harmful and destructive dogmas of modernity thinking and to emancipate myself. More so than about learning, decol decolonizing my own thinking is an ongoing, flawful and troubled process of unlearning. While modernity is based on the negation of the other, it's also based on the negation of that negation. And within the epistemic territory of modernity, we continue to be presented with modernity's narratives of salvation and civilization and progress, while decoloniality is about revealing the concealed dark side of modernity. So although I chose to become an anthropologist um, out of love and respect for other cultures, decoloniality has made me realize how I um, spent the last 20 years building my academic practice on othering, in my case, Moroccan culture and society, 
So studying decoloniality has made me realize that rather writing about others, I should, write, I should be writing with others. I should be using my position to empower other voices. So decoloniality has made me aware of so many unequal power relations in my everyday life not only as a researcher, but also in my personal life, in my intercultural, interreligious, and interracial marriage and extended family. Well, wow. yeah, it's, it's such an incredible um, moment of, of reflection when you think about um, the, the practice that one chooses and the kinds of steps, and, and I think you've said it um, often this kind of steps of unlearning, um, the unlearning that we need to do to be able to start to reflect um, critically on our own practice um, and our own positionality in that. Um, but I'm kind of going back to, to maybe sort of just thinking a little bit more about this idea of decolonizing and, 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 and the term is is always so um, in different contexts that it can start to mean such different things. And, and I think perhaps we, we can sort of maybe just think about, you know, decoloniality as an orientation or decoloniality as a practice. And I think, I think you were kind of touching on that in, in, in your description of, of, of reflecting on your own work in Morocco, decoloniality as a orientation or as a practice? Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I do agree with you that there's many different ways how decolonizing is being used and interpreted in different contexts and by different people. And I think it's important to point out how we as the research collective are using the term decoloniality to refer to an intellectual body of work strongly rooted in Latin America and formulated by influential thinkers like Anibal Quijano, Walter Mignolo, uh, Rolando Vasquez, Maria Lugones, Jean Casimir, and many, many others. For me personally, it's important to emphasize that I do not own this knowledge, but rather owe it to these inspirational thinkers. The idea for this conversation series actually came when I was fortunate to participate in the Decolonial Summer School last year, when I was so incredibly blessed to listen to these people speak personally. With this series, I hope to transmit some of the work and the ideas of these great thinkers. And personally, my current thinking and writing is greatly influenced by Rolando Vasquez, who is a professor of sociology at the Roosevelt University College in Utrecht and the initiator of the Decolonial, Fashion, uh, Decolonial Summer School. In my article, I introduced some of the key propositions of the decolonial critique of the modern colonial order as formulated by Rolando Vasquez. And an important one for me is the proposition of delinking. While I previously thought that including other fashion systems in contemporary fashion discourse would be the way to overcome Eurocentrism in fashion, decoloniality made me realize how this actually leads to erasing difference. Acknowledging other fashion systems as modern and contemporary is actually assimilating them and erasing diversity. Rather than making other ways of fashioning fit, fit the definition of contemporary fashion, I think the definition should be formulated as to accommodate a diversity of ways of fashioning the body. And decoloniality has made me understand that in order to decolonize fashion, fashion needs to be radically redefined by delinking it from modernity, the very uh, core of its constitution, and therefore from coloniality by redefining it as a multitude of possibilities in and outside modernity, rather than as a normative framework falsely claiming universality. So decolonizing fashion for me is about allowing for the recognition of a plurality of epistemologies in regards to fashioning the body. The purpose is to revalue a diversity that has been rendered invisible, erased, discriminated, and defutured by the coloniality of contemporary fashion. So I think 
decolonizing is often referring to taking something out like i'm 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 basing or how you say that i'm referring to my field work in in morocco when we're talking about decolonizing it's often this idea of a pure moroccan right taking the european fashion influences out of it whereas i the way i see or or, or read the decoloniality is much more about revealing an erased and especially an erased history in the case of morocco mm -hmm. i know it's it's um such an incredible um set of dynamics that we're working with um and and so on one level we're working with this idea around decoloniality and, and and to try and unpack the complexities of that as a term as a practice but on the other level we're also looking at fashion and and so you know i think um, i'm aware of the time that we we've we've kind of got to, to our 20 20 minutes almost so we've got about another five minutes or so before we go into into the breakout rooms I, i'm thinking maybe we could just sort of think about this fashion as a verb and fashion as a noun and, and the implications of that? Yes, so yeah, for me, fashion as a noun, so contemporary fashion has come to refer to a temporality of contemporaneity, a system of inequality and an industry of capitalism particular to modernity. But fashioning as a verb, the act of fashioning the body is of all temporalities and geographies. So the way fashion scholars in the North have put modernity at the core of fashion's definition is intrinsic to its discriminatory nature. This claim to modernity endorses a superiority over not fashion, a universality as being the only real fashion, and a contemporaneity as being unique to the here and the now, and therefore enforces categories of racial, cultural, and temporal discrimination. So in the same way that modernity is particularly uniform and does not leave any space for an actual diversity, contemporary fashion is discriminating um, by not leaving any space for other ways of fashioning the body. So systems of fashioning outside modernity, meaning places uh, with genealogies and trajectories different from modernity, are deliberately and systematically discriminated against, silenced and erased simply by how fashion as a noun has come to be defined. Yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the tension that then also um, starts to play out in terms of how this how this word has evolved over time and and what we need to do to kind of almost de-link it from from the thing that that has been driving it so so mm -hmm. there's there's a, a, a series of 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 complex um dynamics that that i think are being pointed to um and particularly um um through through what um Rolando and and walter sort of point to in 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 their work um and, and I think you'd use the word delinking. So, um, you know, it's just a, a thought that we need to kind of just hold on to there. But I think I think for the benefit of 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 using the, the time to kind of have a conversation, I'm I'm thinking that we go into our breakout rooms now. Um, and the breakout room is really so that we can start to to get to know one another and actually have a conversation because this is a conversation between you and I but actually we want to have the conversation with with each other as well so um, I might sort of move from room to room um, we'll stop the recording once we go into the breakout room um, but I might move from room to room so just continue the conversation if I do enter your room <laughs> without knocking I'll just land um, but um, there are two things. I think the first thing is that um, we'll just, um, the first thing is, is we really just want you to introduce yourselves to each other. What brought you to this particular conversation on a Saturday, um, morning, evening, daytime, nighttime, um, Sunday morning? <laughs> um, or, and so first, just, to, just what brought you to this room uh, and what brought you to the conversation? And then secondly, um, and I'm sort of thinking 
you know, just in terms of your paper um, and, and the title of your paper, the title of your article, the, the sort of um, phantasm, um, fashion and the phantasmagoria of modernity. Um, and, and maybe sort of within the group sort of, how did that land for each of you? You know, what, what was that? Where did it, where did it land for you? Where did, um, you know, what is, what is the, the phantasmagoria of modernity that is so clinging to, to fashion? So maybe just as, as a, as a conversation piece. And then when we come out of the, um, out of the breakout rooms, then um, I think we um, can come back and, and hopefully have a little bit, a bit of a discussion where, where you can feed back on that. So I think if Shana sort of sends you off to the breakout rooms, your screen will go blank a little bit. Um, don't panic. Um, it does take a little while and you'll suddenly find yourself somewhere and we'll see you when you come back. <laughs>